Hello, dear participants, and we are ready to move on to the next session, and uh, I'm ready to represent the moderator of the next discussion, designer of the future who creates digital reality in the cities, Ilda Yakubov. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to greet all the participants of our discussions. The topic of our discussion today is the design of the future, and we are going to speak about how different people and companies create new mechanics of interaction between us and urban space, and who is going to become the element of this interaction. Our exciting discussion today is filled with really wonderful participants, um, representatives of uh, uh, companies uh, such uh, as uh, Yandex, um, Anastasia Markitan, head of the communication projects at Yandex uh, Maps, uh, and uh, Ulyana Kudina, the senior product manager of Yandex Maps, um, Oleg uh, Yusupov, co founder and uh, general director of the technological company Fugitalism, Dasha Nasonova the co-founder of uh, the studio for the development of uh, video games at Ergia, and uh, Denis uh, Zapor um, Zaporozhan, design director for products and communications in gas from oil. So I would like to remind you, dear participants, that you can ask your, your questions in the chat of our broadcasting. We will discuss your questions uh, at the end. Uh, please don't be shy, be active, and we will try to take as many questions as possible. I'm I'm handing over to the first uh, speaker, and uh, the first one to speak uh, will be Dasha Nasonova. So, Daria, please uh, speak about uh, yourself uh, and your projects. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Dasha, and uh, I deal with video games. So, it happened uh, that uh, just like uh, the video universe is moving to meta world, uh, and all the projects uh, are also related to meta universe so in this discussion i'd like to speak a little bit how meta universes are interrelated what technologies are used there and what designers urban developers and all the people interested in urban development can use a few words about meta universe as a word it's a trendy one it's a buzzword I like the definition by German Nerula, the CEO of uh, Improbable Companies. So German Nerula compares uh, a meta universe uh, with the websites and internet. Uh, meta universe uh, has the relation to the virtual reality as website uh, to the internet. Uh, in meta universe, uh, you can have different uh, smaller universes and different topics, and the users can choose uh, in what of the universe he or she wants to live. Um, for public at large, uh, um, they know meta-universe on the basis of the movie Ready Player One. Usually they use it uh, in example to explain the interrelation between the users uh, and uh, virtual reality in the context of meta-universe. But I think that now when we speak about video games, um, then one of the brightest examples is Fortnite. And Fortnite not as a game, platform, but uh, as uh, the founder uh, of uh, Fortnite uh, said, it's not a video game uh, anymore, it's a meta universe. And what he actually meant was that the specifics of uh, Fortnite, and uh, so uh, that it's a platform for socialization, the organized concerts there, it's uh, like an alternative reality where people can exist. It's, uh, might, it might be the similar to Second Life uh, game for the old uh, generation of gamers. Video games, uh, I mean, multi-user video games, uh, say they not only an alternative reality. There's another trend uh, to be focused on NFT and blockchain. The games are built on blockchains. Uh, the game transactions uh, happen with the use of blockchain. And all in all, the game characters uh, it's not only um, 
signature on the document. Uh, these are certificates that are created with the help of blockchain. So Illuvium is one of the video games like that, and they use such technologies here. So why do I draw an example of this video game? Have a look at the visualization. Here you can see reference not only to financial pyramids, but uh, here they use tokens, and they use tokens uh, to have transactions inside of the game, but also to have a decentralized uh, governance of the game, meaning that in traditional games, all the decisions uh, are taken by the directors and game designers, but in this case, uh, the owners uh, of tokens uh, have uh, a right uh, to choose a concilium on what uh, new locations will appear in the game or what characters uh, will be developed by game designers uh, and illustrators and what game actions uh, will be developed by game designers. All in all, a decentralized model of organization is an alternative to a traditional one. We all know a traditional model of governance. It's like a vertical of power where people uh, on higher position in the structure of the corporation have the biggest impact. And in a decentralized autonomous model, all the participants, so all the stakeholders uh, have uh, almost the same rights. Why do I think that uh, this topic uh, is uh, highly relevant uh, for urban development and participatory pro design? I think so, because decentralization allows simple people and citizens take part in decision-making related to urban environment. I think that token-related idea can work perfectly in this field because uh, it almost completely takes away a possibility of fakes, uh, fake signatures, um, or decisions taken by large stakeholders. Um, let me give you an example. Socios.com platform. It's a special platform uh, for football fans. Um, I don't know anything about football, but I just like uh, the idea of uh, communicating with the game community. Here, the matter is that um, in socios.com, different football clubs uh, can uh, have uh, can introduce their tokens and then fans can take decisions related to the clubs, like choose a track that will be played, for example, at the beginning of the football match. Then inside of this application, there is another function, it's called the token hunt, meaning that users can hunt for tokens in the cities, they can search for them with the help of uh, virtual reality and then uh, they can uh, use the tokens uh, in order to influence uh, the decisions that uh, are important for their football clubs or teams. Um, and now coming to the end uh, of the short part of my presentation, I believe that participatory design can get a lot from the use uh, of blockchain technologies because decentralization is a key specific feature or factor in influencing how people can uh, have an impact uh, on uh, the external environment, um, on the decision making about the image uh, of the city to make sure that their voice uh, was uh, heard. To my mind, uh, if uh, urban or development projects uh, try to use blockchain technologies in order to take this or that decision related to the urban development of territories, uh, it can be transformed into exciting experiment uh, showing how stakeholders uh, can uh, interact uh, with uh, representatives of community in order to get efficient uh, results that would satisfy the needs of different stakeholders. Wow, great. Thank you very much, Daria, for your presentation. And uh, it really echoes uh, what interests me. And now I think we move on to the next expert. And the next expert is uh, Anastasia Markitan. So Anastasia, I would like to hand over to you. Anastasia, 
Hi, Hi, my name is Nastya, and I'm involved in communication at uh, Yandex Maps. Uh, together with my colleague uh, Oliana, who is a product manager, we are going to speak about the future of the maps. Very often when we work in the maps, we hear questions from people like, what new things uh, can you come up with in the maps? Because uh, uh, mapping services are taken uh, by people as uh, something like hot water water from the tap, something that all of us have and they don't know what uh, new things can appear there. So we made a huge step uh, on the way of uh, developing maps. Uh, we know how to show price lists of the restaurants, for example. We know how to show stories, reviews. Uh, we build the routes. Um, this is what happens by default now, right? So in course of 17 years uh, of map existence, we have come to a point uh, where the only way for the development of urban mapping is to improve uh, the relevance of data. In addition to that, it's necessary to improve uh, the quality of data reflection. So my colleague Uliana is going to speak about that and 3D generative maps. Uliana, I give the floor to you. Yes, um, hello everyone. Yes, hello everyone. Let's continue the topic uh, raised by Anastasia. Why do we need uh, 3D maps uh, when everything is fine? I mean, um, you know how to build uh, a route from one place to another, you know how to organize things. Uh, what comes next? So, when you use a, a geo application, the entrance uh, baseline uh, is implied, meaning that uh, the users should know not only how to read uh, the interface, but also how to read maps. In addition to that, uh, we, so to say, believe uh, that they know how to build a 3D stage, and most importantly, understand their position in the map. I'm convinced uh, that all of you have uh, some friends uh, who have problems uh, with uh, transferring a 2D map into a 3D world and backwards. Actually, it's quite a labor and resource intensive work um, that the brain starts uh, uh, to escape. Um, so, of course, a difficult kind of activity causes frustration in the world. Uh, there's uh, no person that would like uh, to develop a user's uh, product that causes frustration. And uh, if we use our imagination, then it seems to us uh, that the next big challenge uh, for map and services uh, would be like that, to make uh, a simple way to understand where you are on the map for a user at the beginning of the route uh, and uh, at the last mile of it. Like uh, when you have um, uh, a difficult overlapping of uh, the roads uh, or at the point of destination. We organized uh, our own research and uh, it demonstrates uh, that the users of Yandex maps um, sometimes uh, check uh, how the panoramic view looks like uh, if uh, they want to go to a place they have never been before. And now there are more than 350,000 persons uh, in uh, per day that use uh, panoramic views in the maps. It seems uh, that uh, it's not uh, a really uh, energy-saving mode uh, of uh, using your resources, so we believe that modern mapping should offer something more efficient in this regard, uh, offer new solutions. Um, here, for example, let's have a look uh, at uh, the sketches. Uh, 3D maps look like that. So I think that this kind of approach um, can be observed um, in new Apple maps. Uh, if you have a look at San Francisco map, for example, it looks like that. 
In addition to that, you can see it in games, where, again, users uh, can, uh, in advance, uh, have a look uh, at the panoramic view, at the panoramic map, uh, and you can fix uh, some of the top priority points. Now, from this uh, topic, uh, I would like to move on to the solutions that are already implemented in the maps, and I hand over to Anastasia to do it. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and actually, I wanted to speak about more applied things that appear in the maps uh, and uh, taken uh, by people as a part of the evolution, but the paradigm of uh, such uh, service consumption changes. Uh, you are all used to, to have the service of uh, Yandex gas station when you can pay for gas uh, without going out of the car. So in the maps, uh, this uh, service is also accessible. You can come to a gas station, you can choose the uh, type of uh, gas you need, you can pay for it. More than one million people use the service on a regular basis. What is it? Uh, it uh, is uh, embedded transaction in the map. Uh, so we get some commission from each uh, transaction. The users uh, can satisfy their needs uh, while traveling by car, and it can be different uh, from gas stations, to the delivery of food, the payment for parking lots, and so on. As an experiment, uh, we are now thinking about the development of a transaction-based scenario. So I gave you Yandex uh, gas stations uh, as an example. It's a well-known service. It's quite successful. Right now, if we say uh, with people that in the past there, will, there was no opportunity to pay for gas like that, we all remember that, of course. Uh, but for now, the service uh, became an absolutely native scenario. What comes next? Um, uh, we have uh, started uh, the food delivery to the car, and here you can see the interface with the first uh, pilot partner. It was Burger King. So it's a process that goes like that. You come to a restaurant, uh, fast food restaurant. You can choose uh, the food, uh, write down uh, the number of your car, pay for the transaction, and it will be given to your car. It's super convenient uh, when the weather is bad, when you don't want to go out of your car. This is the way for you to save money and your scenario of uh, moving around the city is smooth, so you don't have to go out of the car, download additional applications to do some things. Plus, uh, in addition to that, uh, maybe you have heard about it, uh, but uh, recently we have uh, implemented uh, the scooter renting service uh, in the map. And it's also about transactions. The transactions are embedded in the map. So I gave you all these examples and I just wanted to show you that geo applications become a universal ecosystem system where it is easy to integrate diverse uh, services. Um, they are native when you're on the road. And uh, so in the future, they can provide more instruments in order to satisfy your everyday needs in the city. What does it all mean for the user? It all means that we have a single entry point, like Yandex Maps. Well, I give you this example because I know about our services and Yandex does a lot about it in Yandex Maps. For example, you can do a lot of actions uh, from buying food, uh, ordering food, uh, paying for the parking lots. And how does it change our interaction with the city? Well, it's evident that it changes it. Such mapping services uh, become a universal urban application that not only builds a route from point A to point Z for you and finds the necessary organizations and addresses, but it also helps you uh, go along the consumer flow and uh, resolve your task. It seems to me that uh, the more native scenarios uh, appear in the maps, uh, the more easily easier it will be for people to live in the city, or at least it will be more comfortable because they will be able to do everything in one application. And a side effect uh, of uh, transaction um, introduction is that uh, the 
loading on the user uh, decreases because uh, uh, we get uh, profit uh, from the Commission for Transactions. So to my mind, uh, this scenario is uh, one of uh, the possibilities uh, to develop in the future when it comes to mapping, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Uliana. It will be really, really exciting for us to discuss uh, possible scenarios uh, and uh, find uh, uh, the opinions uh, uh, of uh, people because you work uh, with the needs uh, of millions of people and you develop scenarios, uh, uh, how to satisfy their needs. I think that this topic will be highly interesting for our discussion. I really liked your phrase uh, that um, the developers do not want uh, to cause frustration, but such developers uh, exist, uh, like artists, for example. Sometimes uh, during their work, uh, they on purpose create uh, things uh, that uh, have to cause uh, frustration of the users. Um, and now I would like to hand over to the next uh, speaker, Oleg uh, uh, Yusupov, who is co-founder and general director of technological company Fidgetalism. This company created a whole community around it, uh, which works uh, in the experimental artistic field, but they also work with real practical cases for specific tasks. Oleg, I hand over to you. So hopefully I will not be frustrating anybody. It's a pleasure to see many of you again. I mean, I've known a lot of you for quite a while. Like the rest of the speakers, I do have three minutes, so I will be brief and then I will happily answer questions. My name is Oleg Yusupov. I am the CEO of Fidgetalism Company. We do Fidgetal. Not to confuse with fidgets. So, what we're doing is that we are approaching physical to digital. We have a number of projects in physical, digital, and art in particular. We're probably one of the few studios in Russia who is Emmy nominated, been nominated just a month ago. Speaking about tech, I want to talk about CGI, VR, AR, and 3D machine learning. Working with 3D um, data with the machine learning learning. I will just um, briefly mention a few points, but in the context of today's conversation, uh, probably the major point that I want to highlight is 3D GIS systems for the city in 3D. It's been already mentioned today, augmented reality, VR, we have been discussing this issue already today. We have actual business application. We have recreated in 3D the tools for data visualization of the company from business. And now we're speaking particularly about uh, real estate developer. So it's possible to see the entire map of Moscow. This is an interesting, exciting, multi-layered system. And we had a number of questions of contemplating in 3D, thinking in 3D. It's important to augment not only reality, but also thinking so that the users could not only see the landscape differently, but also it's important to augment the thinking ability of the designers because it turns out to that uh, 3D visualization like this is not a trivial task. Hardly a few people were doing this. And for many uh, designers, this is a journey for discovery and for mapping services as well. And the advantage of making this in real-time engines, which is gaming engines, is that you can easily port it into augmented reality, VR, where you can use all of these data directly on the phone live or just to walking down the city and seeing how much uh, for example uh, costs a particular apartment in a building next to you another point about 3d it's uh, common knowledge that we're now digitizing our cities more and more specifically with lidar there are these drones, um, driverless vehicles uh, driving around the city, scanning the city with LiDAR to create geospatial panoramas of the city and navigation directions for the city. We have been doing a similar thing. One of our projects is meant 
to define based on a LiDAR scan the point cloud and uh, identify infrastructure objects. It's an interesting task. It's also interesting because if we want to be doing it, we need a completely new set of knowledge. We need to be able to work in 3D ML. This is the research approach that we have been using. We have a new master's program for that even, and the designer also need to be able to work with the statistical data generator, because for now, even though we're saying a lot about a ton of data that's available in 3D and 2D, but however, if we need to solve a particular task, we need to test it on a generator of data in order to improve the algorithm Rhythm. So when we put together drones, LiDAR from the driverless cars, real-time engines, we can, for example, generate this sort of system when, based on synthetic data in a gaming engine, we have a car driving through GTA San Andreas, and therefore it's learning to drive around the real city. A few quick words about AR, a number of cases. Fortunately, now we have more and more exciting applications of AR in the city, so that an ordinary consumer could do more with AR and understand what AR is. First of all, of course, outdoor navigation is becoming more and more common. But another significant thing is, in my opinion, indoor navigation, which can be used for the city as well. It could be important for the city, but the task here is um, fundamentally different. If we can restore the city based on GPS scans or satellite scans, LiDAR or AR indoor navigation is more of an issue of privacy, and GPS not often works within a building. Here, we have a very different task. But again, this task is essential for mapping services and for future designers. Here, we have been implementing a number of interesting projects um, so in order to position a human being in the space based on computer vision. For example, do it in the office or in the mall. And another thing, the designers of the future need to be ready to VR or a metaverse that has just been announced. I mean, we should understand that the space that we're talking about, or the, say the city, is not a physical space anymore. Space becomes um, meta. And here's the educational party that we hosted. Three speakers from Bali, Dubai, and Moscow came together online. We put people together offline in order to talk to them so that they would listen to this presentation. Therefore, we understand that a designer would need to be able to think in um, a number of dimensions, planes, VR, offline, online, YouTube, all together, everything all of the time. The designers are facing a lot of very exciting tasks. Please sign up, I'll be happy. The designers of the future are facing a number of exciting challenges and we'll probably discuss uh, the solutions to the problems during this discussion in the future. Let me invite our next expert, Denis, the design director for products and communications at Gazprom Neft. Please welcome Denis Zaparajan. Видно ли трансляцию моего экрана? Окей, ладно. Я начну. Итак, да, я работаю в компании Газпром Нефть. So I represent Газпром Нефть Company. I'm in charge of design. And we have a special center for product design in a framework of our product transformation center. I'm very engaged into technology, parametric, and generative design and visual programming. I used to 
worked for RIA News Infographics, and I'm still very much engaged into data visualization. I love to do it non-conventionally. Our company, Gazprom Neft, is following the track of digital transformation, and that means that we're developing and integrating a number of technical solutions and tools. It's all related to processing of a number of, of data sets, and we need to integrate complex IT solutions. Most of them do have the UI. Most of the processes in the company, individualization, all of the branches and departments interact via information systems and communication materials, and all of this requires some degree of design. When there is a huge number of diverse interfaces and products, it's hard to manage them. We need to systematize it and manage user experience. That is why within our company, in our center, we have created our very own design system called Consta. We have made it for free. It's available to everybody. It's open source. So you can openly, freely download it at GitHub, for example, and hook up your project to it. Working on our design system, when we have been designing our design system, we have determined a number of principles and similarities. How can we tie uh, a design system to a classical architecture. Here are five principles that are all essential for both physical world and meta environment. Contemporary person lives in two realities at the same time, physical world in the space of the city, urban environment that is, and the digital world. In the world of interfaces, diverse um, systems and interfaces help us to uh, facilitate our lives. That's how also we connect to one another. In any space, be it digital or physical, we need to find our way, and technologies are trying to help us with that. It's considered that most of the people in the world are visuals. They mostly perceive the world visually. Of of course, that sort of split is very conditional, but most of the elements of popular culture made this visual future when we have some digital assistance or tools for digital visualization that augment visual reality. This is what we're all anticipating, waiting for portable devices and augmented reality devices for visualization. However, augmented reality technologies even today are highly applicable in highly professional spheres, medical services, engineering, aviation, industry, industrial production. In our, in our company, we apply a number of scenarios for AR application. For example, last year at the Omsk oil refinery facility, we have successfully tested the technology for remote control of the construction works. And that particularly happened during the midst of pandemic when when this technology all of a sudden broadened our capabilities, which were limited with the lockdown. To put it mildly, employees at the company working in production were wearing these visual headset, and they were the avatar for the expert who was making construction decisions while being in a different country. Another vector for the development of our company is, of course, digital twin. If we put it super simply, these are software uh, duplicate of a physical object. And this uh, digital duplicate modulates uh, the internal and physical characteristics of the object. Sometimes it may be a number of technical processes or a number of technical details. Digital twin is a sort of interface and intermediary between the physical device and the important information that needs to be used to make a decision to apply this particular physical detail. It's in the industrial production, we can do it thanks to the huge data that we collect via connected computer computational systems, sensors as well. In our daily life, the obvious application for digital twin of the city is a mapping service that has been mentioned a number of times today. This sort of services have been helping us a lot to find our way in this space. If we take a special look at the quote of the Sapiens book, which is both uh, classics and mainstream today, we can say that we are living in the future, which we have been anticipating so much. Voice assistants and voice interfaces that I fully believe in, by the way, have been for a while already broadening our capabilities to find our way within physical and digital environment. And in our daily life as well today, businesses designed as a service turn our perception of the urban space upside down. If we consider urban space via the prism of accessibility of the most important goods and services, essential goods and services, less and less do we care about the... Uh, 
uh, Isochron map and mobility accessibility thanks to sharing and delivery services. If we imagine that visualization of the city will be adjusting to our needs, to the way we need to be seeing the city here and now as we need it, then we can imagine it as a sort of bended visualization which reflects uh, what we have heard about 3d visualization mapping this is one of my favorite projects by schultz and web studio they have designed this uh, curious way of bending the urban space which was supposed to help people who face difficulties in finding their way in the abstraction of the flat geographic map this is how it looks in the animation. I love different sorts of non-conventional visualizations, and this really resonates with me. <laughs> a coffee table of an artist from Cyprus. And let me conclude with the phrase, which is banal, but still, the future is now, and we live in it. And this is the dryer for high glasses that I bought on AliExpress. Thank you. Uh, Denis, uh, Denis, thank you so much uh, for this very intensive um, lecture. It really does resonate to what the speakers were saying right before you. Now, I would like to take the floor to briefly describe what I have been personally doing in the last months, but of course in relation to our discussion. Let me open the presentation first. If I put it generally, describing my activities as a teacher and curator, I mostly do experiments in different ways of cultural production and cultural consumption. I am interested in all of those formats of how roles and conventional hierarchies to create cultural content and distribution can be blurred recontemplate it and blur this summer for example in the city of Tumen in russia we participated in the um, urban theater festival street theater festival we created a lab uh, for multimedia and cultural marketing the point of the lab was to put together within the educational project that would teach them to create multimedia objects that would be telling to the wider audience about a particular cultural event inviting and engaging more audience to participate discuss and just participate in many different ways and let me highlight that we have used one of the most popular public spaces of Tumen, the embankment near the um, shipping culture center. We create this environment that puts together virtual space that can include anybody using their mobile tools so that people can just participate in the lottery and win, for example, tickets to the shows of the festival. This space as well was displayed on a huge LED screen showing the large group dynamics between the people who are coming together around the screen, managing their avatar using mobile devices. This was quite a curious experience. Especially valuable was the fact that it was created by the people who have just found out about this technology and just learned to use it during a week of a lab. Another case that I wanted to talk about, the concept of a community space under the uh, huge uh, car routing place in Kazan, in the city of Kazan. We wanted to create a public space um, with a number of modules. First of them is the, the so-called open speaker, which is a presentation venue for where anybody can either present or just put some musical track to uh, congratulate a friend with a particular uh, event. We also wanted to install a number of screens where anybody could upload a person art and the third thing is a, a laser announcement board where in the real time you can publish a message that was the attempt to channelize everybody's intention to make a mark in a public space especially under this sort of uh, motor junction 
So here's one of the options of how these models can be used. These modules have very low accessibility threshold. Pretty much anybody can participate in these things here and now. So any passerby pretty much can very quickly get some sort of exciting feedback from this public space. However, the second way of a interaction with the space is uh, more tailored to local communities who host different sorts of projects. So a community can register there and put together those modules for one particular system to host a big event. For example, it's possible to schedule under this bridge a number of uh, lectures and workshops and visualizations so that all of these visual tools are unified in a framework of a single logic. For example, Laser is announcing a particular lecture, uh, the sound is being broadcasted down the space and on the screen it is possible to see the schedule of the event. All of these things represent some sort of digital interface of access to one unified multimedia space. Therefore, I would like to now draw your attention to the first cycle of our discussion. I call it more interfaces, like more cowbell, more interfaces. So who and how creates all of these points of inter-exchange between people and between people and urban environment. And what are the what is the future of this interaction? The cases that you're about to see were mentioned today already, partially. They are just particularly representative. We were talking about car fueling with Yandex. We were talking about Google Live View, which was mentioned by two speakers. All of these formats, unlike more creative ex and experimental projects of mine are giving us more of a commodity-based insight and a more serious overlook on UX design, a design of the interfaces that will help people to interact with the city. Let us discuss these cases. I would like to begin with a question addressed to Dasha Nasonova. Dasha, you mentioned quite a number of exciting subjects, uh, particularly decentralization that could be mentioned in the multimedia space uh, under the bridge that I described, where local communities decide on their own what will be happening there. An hour and a half ago, in a previous discussion, we were talking about 99% versus 1%. 1% 1 of the highly engaged users, which statistically represent the fact that 1% of users generate more content than the remaining 99. Dasha, in your opinion, taking into account all the attempts for distributed and decentralized mechanics of managing some sort of social issues or just urban space. In your opinion, how um, can we work with this sort of significant issue? I mean, it's hard to engage people, 99% versus 1%. Of course, it's cool to select the musical track that begins the football match. Maybe the fans are engaged into that, but maybe not. Well, this is a big issue, and there's a lot of room for experiment there. First and foremost, the idea of decentralization has huge potential, particularly for participatory planning. As I have have said already, these gamification technologies, when we make decisions, they seem to be much more efficient than traditional voting. Nevertheless, I would agree with you, high-tech content is not produced by too many users, not many people dive deep into the sort of uh, high-tech content production and the threshold here in my opinion is a smartphone as it is naturally because the technology that would help people to approach to production of the high-tech digital content is not well distributed it's not well approachable not all of the mobile devices can create or even consume ar for example or just art when we were doing project at the shukhov lab i have faced a situation that only a number of students were able to execute all of the tasks that were predetermined for the program just because not all of the smartphones of theirs were able to handle AR just resource-wise, computing-wise. I'm a big fan of AR. Personally, as a user, I believe that it is much more pleasurable as opposed to VR. I believe that a smartphone is not the best tool to consume AR to experience they 
are, I would say. This proportion, 99 versus 1, will be there as long as people do not have more access to technology, particularly technology of experiencing AR. I'm talking about some smart lenses, summer glasses. These things are promising. Navigation as well. But to the fact that we need to hold a phone in your hand is, is just a confinement. It's alienating. And when when we will get access, broader access to glasses or lens to immerse into AR, that sort of immersion will be much more common. This device needs to be a linking tool. Until then, we need to be using our head at start to establish different sorts of creative experiments and tests. And the thing that you're doing is really cool, by the way. Yes, Dasha, thank you. As a matter of fact, it truly is an exciting thing, this to contradicting intentions on the one hand, get rid of a smartphone, on the other hand, use the most accessible platform that is already in everybody's hands. And I believe that maybe Alek would be able to comment on that in more detail, because Physicalism, digitalism is uh, often applying experimental formats, hosting the, these online parties that require different sorts of technological devices to view, to participate, provide different ways of access. Uh, in the future, how are you going to split access to similar services for people who have different technical capabilities? So what can be done to make this uh, accessibility threshold lower while preserving the quality of access? Speaking about the party, Ildar will talk about that in more detail later. That's thing one. Thing two, speaking about interfaces, more interfaces and the balance between a number of users and um, the form factor as it is. Indeed, this is the essential problem and I fully agree with the previous speaker, with Dasha, who were saying that augmented reality via the phone is not a form factor that we're looking for. We need to be looking at that via B2B, so that in production, for example, you could have spare resources, spare hands to execute certain routine operations. And if this future comes, it will be coming from industrial application, where, as a matter of fact, they have been using AR for 10 years already in, the, in our company in terms of interface we call it the next step for evolution, natural user environment, when natural interaction, when we, there is natural interaction with life space. We used to have, in the middle of the 20th century, huge machines, mainframes, and only professionals could program those machines via common prompt. Then we transitioned to graphic UIs, and that's what we're using at the moment. We have folders, uh, mouse clicks, etc. But that's not the computer. That's just convenient for human beings. Now we're facing a number of experiments on how all of this is going to work. Digital, voice, uh, visual, Zoom user interface, 3D interface, etc., etc. A ton of diverse uh, researchers. And uh, we're trying... We're calling it natural user environment. We're using this term, natural using user environment, umbrella term. Diving deeper into this, I mean, if you want to dive deeper into this subject, because it's obviously not a two-minute conversation, take a look at this visual research that we have for machine vision. Where we segment and classify all of the approaches in computer vision that exist at the moment and could be done to classify all of the tasks that we have just described. Google Live View assumes working with the algorithms of computer vision using our smartphones. There are some interfaces related to digital versus physical. This is happening via cyber-physical systems and direction of analog data and digital data. I mean, I could be talking about this for a long time. Just stop me.
But the major idea here is that, yes, indeed, we're moving into the new paradigm of interaction, human to machine interaction with new interfaces. However, we do not fully know what that paradigm would be and what interfaces will be there primarily. That's an open question. And we need the help of the researchers to figure it out. Alec, thank you. I fully support the fact that researchers are about to help us. At this stage of technical development, it's getting exceptionally curious to observe the intersection of those domains of knowledge that seem to be quite far from one another. People from IT, people from philosophy are working at similar levels of abstraction, solving similar tasks and exchanging experiences and um, enriching uh, knowledge of one another. And it's great to observe what's happening in your educational programs, but that's a subject for a very different discussion. Alec, thank you. I would like all of us to continue with our discussion. And let me show you a number of slides, because we're limiting with, limited with time. So, I would like to dedicate the five or ten minutes, uh, remaining minutes of our discussion to talk about city as a social network. What is happening when we're seeing physical space of a city via the lens of a social network, when we put together our interaction with a city and its particular spaces with the tools of virtual communication? One of the examples here is Yandex traffic jams, Yandex Propki. Uh, as you know, this is sort of a community tool to report uh, accidents and traffic jams on the road, like Waze, similar to Waze. And it's possible to chat within the app. And it's a very particular example how the tool was created with a particular goal, and then it was adjusted by the community for a particular use. So it's a fun case of how interface is being adjusted, not adjusted, but um, kind of appropriated by the community. Another curious case is the app by the uh, it's the app called Earth Speaker by Olafur Olafur Eliasson. The idea of the app is that the kids could protect the Earth using this app. This app, via the technology of face tracking, allows you to transfer your face mimic onto any object that your camera sees. And on behalf of a river, you can say, hey, I'm very muddy, please don't do that anymore. Or on behalf of the forest, you can say, hey, stop making fires in here. And all of this is being pitched as a platform where the kids can express their opinion, could speak up on behalf of the planet. And that could be tied to a particular spot on a map, making a map of those messages from the younger generation regarding the future of our planet. Planet. Plus, uh, there are a lot of other applications uh, which are also related to maps uh, and they also look really exciting. Now, let's speak uh, about the fact uh, what happens when we try to bring uh, together social media and maps. How does that work? In the very beginning, I would like to hand over to the representatives of Yandex Maps. Could you please tell us about your personal feelings uh, of such uh, experience uh, and talks? Uh, so what is the attitude of the company related to the development of uh, services uh, closer to social media? Yeah, 
ты возьмешь слово, да? Ульяна, я would you like to start? Мне кажется, что лучше тебе, да? I think that you should start, actually, Anastasia, because that is a question about the company in general, and I can just uh, briefly tell you about the company. It's not really about Yandex, uh, but actually we can see that there is an uh, interrelation uh, between a Snapchat and the maps um, and uh, Instagram. These are the first steps. What uh, the previous guys uh, told us, I agree with them. A telephone now is not a device that uh, allows you to talk or with the help of uh, which uh, you just stay in touch, but you actually use uh, VR. So everyone is wor waiting for a special device um, to use it. And, and maybe if we use uh, our imagination, then mixed reality communication will be completely different. Maybe people will wear lenses or maybe people will wear glasses and then the communication can be completely different um, the events uh, the connections uh, with what happens in the city can land uh, on something completely different something that doesn't exist today you are walking around the street you wear a special device and see something new in the landscape around you and now i would like to hand over to my colleague and Anastasia. Right. As far as the merger of the map and services and social media is concerned, it really exists. And there are some examples of data and applications that are related to geolocation and uh, to the distance uh, between the locations of people. As a representative of GeoService, I don't think uh, that uh, Yandex Maps uh, will integrate into social media and will become an analog of social media because uh, we have a different task. Our task is to navigate people as accurately as possible. So to add uh, some uh, functions uh, related to socializing features, uh, this is not what we are going to do. But anyway, a map is uh, the kind of a basis that has penetrated into a lot of services, including social media. I mean that it comes, uh, it starts with the delivery and it ends with dating, but everything is based on the maps. Speaking about Yandex maps, um, we work a lot to improve uh, our personal account um, uh, where you can save your favorite spaces, you can take pictures of the places you have been to, you share your feedback in order to improve the map. It's not secret that map users can uh, give a feedback about each point in the city if uh, there's some incorrect uh, information given. Another interesting feature is as follows, uh, not many people know about it, uh, it's called mirrors. Um, it's an ability to take pictures of reality around you, which is related to geolocation, and add the pictures, uh, or upload them to the system. They are transformed into a slideshow, and other users, before building the route, can uh, check how the route uh, will look like. And this is the route that the previous user have gone through. Are there any obstacles there, which is especially useful for people with limited mobility, for example, or people on uh, wheelchairs. Um, so a map uh, in this case becomes a platform that adds uh, content. You add content to the map and you help local communities. Um, you help uh, your friends. Uh, you help anyone. You help all the users, uh, all the citizens of Russia, because your content becomes useful for the people who use the map to walk around and they want to see how it all looks like there. So we try to implement a lot of uh, improvements. I don't want to give you too many spoilers, but actually, yes, this is how it goes. Okay, thank you, Anastasia. Uh, thank you, Ulyana. I would uh, be happy to tell you, see you next time. Yandex uh, really is a place uh, where they hold a lot of experiments. I'm really happy about what you did. 
uh, with the uh, maps uh, during uh, an industrial biennale in uh, Yekaterinburg, uh, where it was called art intervention. It was virtual art intervention in the map. That was cool. It was a great experiment. Uh, we look forward to new experiments. Uh, I have a question to Dennis. Um, Dennis, you had a presentation where you represented um, your wide uh, view and your position in general. At the same time, I know the approach uh, of uh, Gazprom to the use of innovative technologies. I know that a long time ago, uh, when uh, uh, the VR hype uh, was in the world, when VR devices uh, appeared in the world, there were meetings uh, where startups uh, could talk to large businesses, and Gazprom had a clear position and a clear request, um, meaning that technologies are already integrated and they can be efficient. So what about a personal point of view and what about the corporate point of view how social communication can develop within the framework of the city and digitalization of the city it seems to me that you have combined two questions in one as far as our technologies are concerned yes we have a special method that determines what approaches should be used first and foremost and it is determined by our strategy as far as social Social media are concerned. You gave us an example, and I really liked uh, the last example that you gave us. Um, and I just uh, recalled a similar case. It's called uh, Hello Lamp Post. It's a platform uh, which, uh, like social media, can combine or bring together the citizens uh, and uh, urban objects. Um, maybe they have seen them a lot of time and maybe they are not uh, so noticeable. Each lamp, uh, each uh, infrastructural object has an identification number, and uh, you can go to the chat uh, with the lamp, uh, and you can start your communication with the lamp and see uh, the uh, messages from other people. It's like uh, uh, what you can see on the walls uh, of your house or what you can see uh, on the walls of different fences. Uh, sometimes uh, the messages are random, but sometimes the messages are useful and communal services or utilities or services responsible for the maintenance of the city infrastructure could be interested in. Uh, we live in two realities at the same time, digital reality and physical analog reality. I've already told you about it and I know that although you as an artist think that uh, there's uh, not uh, always an applied uh, reason of uh, communication for social media, but to my mind, if uh, there is some kind of uh, practical usefulness uh, is always great uh, and uh, it's always better than having communication for the purpose of communication only. Thank you very much, Denise. Uh, and now, dear guys, uh, we have to close our session because the time is up. Thank you very much.